بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد خير الأولين والآخرين وعلى آله وصحابته أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا بزن علما اللهم زدنا ولا زدنا ولا تنقصنا وأكرمنا ولا تهنا وعطنا ولا تحرمنا وأثرنا ولا تؤثر علينا برضع عنا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله it's, uh, it's an honor to be here in your presence uh, and I really uh, do appreciate uh, you all taking the time to come out to uh, to uh, at least uh, uh, I guess you say bear with me uh, as I try to deal with this particular topic uh, which has been titled uh, an Islamic view of race and formation and diversity uh, actually on the website uh, it actually says the Islamic view on uh, race uh, formation and diversity and I purposely did not call it the Islamic view uh, because um, uh, I guess uh, many Muslims when they saw they would see that they would say oh really you know there is the Islamic view on its racial diversity I haven't learned that I've been Muslim for how many years I still don't know what Islam has to say about race for formation and diversity and so maybe I should come to learn this uh, but we do what we do know of the Islamic view of race formation and diversity is that all of us originate from Adam alayhi salam that is the Islamic view that's the extent that we can be certain of that all of us originate from uh, one single soul which of course was split into two and from those two the the world was populated uh, and so there is a certain degree of truth to saying the Islamic view uh, on uh, on the on race formation and diversity uh, but on the other hand um, uh, w there are these mysteries that do exist, or this one particular mystery that does exist amongst uh, the, the human race, we would say, uh, with regard to how we got to where we are today. <clears throat> uh, this particular topic uh, is a type of topic which, uh, if any person were to deal with it, um, 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 uh, naturally uh, you would find some degree of resistance because there are always these sort of assumptions about what the topic is going to be about. Uh, that the topic is not about racism, uh, it's more what I would say race itself first and foremost, but of course there's, certain over, there's a certain overlap between race and racism that uh, I do want to deal with. Uh, uh, this particular topic is <coughs> rooted in uh, uh, that, that same old issue that continues to um, uh, appear over and over uh, throughout our lives, and that is the matter of identity. You know, so uh, many people, all people have uh, sort of multi, a multi-layer -la of, of, of identity that uh, a person could be, uh, of course, you're a man, uh, plus you're a Muslim, plus you are a, a black or African-American or Negro, whatever you want to call yourself, you know, which actually itself shows a sort of search for identity or a woman, uh, she's a Muslim, and she's also Indo-Pakistani, or she's an Arab, but she's also a woman, she's also a mother, she's also a daughter, you know, that, that there are different layers to all people's identity. And so to speak and study <clears throat> the subject of race identity is another aspect of that sort of search for identity. Who are we, you know? Who are we as a people? You know, how did we get here? Of course, uh, that is one of those pressing questions as well that uh, the average one of us uh, has once we enter into the age of distinction. We start to ask certain questions about how did I get here, who my creator is, all of us. Okay, that's part of the fitrah. We have been reminded of a meeting that we had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, prior to our current existence, a type of meeting that none of us, I would imagine, uh, could claim to re recall. But the Quran tells us of this meeting when Allah had took from the back of Adam all of his progeny and made us testify, uh, testify against ourselves, asking us, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we responded, Bala, you know, indeed you are. And then Allah says after that, And takulu yawma qiyamati inna kuna an hadha ghafirin. So that you could not say on the day of resurrection that we had no knowledge of this, that we were heedless of this. 
You know, but, but we really can't remember at the moment, you see, you know, when that this actually happened. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this happened. And so that's because of our fitrah. And that because of that meeting, once we grow, uh, uh, we eventually start to have those type of questions about uh, how did I get here? You know, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, who, who brought me here? Who created me? What, is there some expectation that uh, uh, that that creator has of me? Yeah. And, and, and also another important question is, who am I, of course, with relationship to other beings and other creatures on the planet? And so the question of what is race is a very important question because um, for some, race is a biological fact, right? Uh, average one of us probably would say, well, yeah, it's, you know, it's something real. Yeah, that, that, you know, that a Chinese person is different from an African. Uh, right or uh, uh, a Russian or Georgian person is different from one from from uh, from um, Sri Lanka. You know, that there is something biologically different about us, or at least uh, <clears throat> phenotypic, phen phenotypically, if not genetically, there's something phenotypically about us that's different that makes us or uh, uh, makes us uh, uh, makes it possible for us to identify as being a race of people. On the other hand, there's a theory that says that, well, no, race is uh, a social construction. And so this is important to me because, uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the book, gave us the Qur'an, and he said in this Qur'an that he is the friend of those who believe. He brings them out of darknesses into the light, which fundamentally means that uh, uh, even after becoming a Muslim, that a person can remain in darkness after becoming a Muslim, or in darknesses, or shades of, of darknesses, veils of darknesses from the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person was a, a drunkard yesterday, or a crack addict yesterday, and they became Muslim last night, and they're here with us today, the person is a Muslim, yes, but the person can't claim to be no longer a, a, a drug addict or a, a, an alcoholic. You still are an alcoholic. You still are a drug addict, you see. And, uh, and so uh, in dealing with the issues of race, uh, there's some, some Muslims who have this idea that um, the Muslims shouldn't talk about race. Why? Because the, the roots of racism are just simply kibbutz. So it's just about arrogance and pride and thinking you're better than other people. So if you just deal with that character flaw, that particular vice, of kibr, right? Then, then we can overcome race just by simply dealing with that. But the, the problem I find with that particular understanding is that it gives the impression that both the causes and solutions to our problems are all internal. That there are no external causes or pressures that, that make me uh, an, an incomplete, an imperfect human being or creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, and that is fundamentally the problem. And so, if you think that it's always about me and, and it's always something internal, then I'm never going to be able to see outside of me any problems with the system under which I live. I'm never going to uh, launch a critique against it because I believe that it's part of the natural order, right? To a certain extent, that we are born, brought into this world, uh, uh, whatever country it may be, and uh, regardless of how much we try to educate our, ch our children about uh, race identity, or we try to make them raceless, right? That whatever the situation, that eventually we all have to eventually indoctrinate our children, or at least uh, introduce them to uh, the realities on the ground. That although they may perceive themselves a certain way, that there are others who have a different perception of them. And we have to introduce them to that, that world right, whether we call it the real world or just the world that has been structured, uh, constructed for us, you see. And so, so like for instance, uh, if you ask my daughter uh, uh, what color you are, she'll say brown, right? She won't say black, you know, and you might say you're brown, yeah, but this may be the way that you conceive of yourself or perceive of yourself. Uh, uh, but, but that's because I'm not, I didn't teach her that, that was her own sort of way that she side to sort of apprehend the world, 
You see, you know, that person is, 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 you know, she even made up a, a name for my, my wife's color, called it Mala. You know, she made it up. You know, it's a made up word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, but that's, that's her. But, but she, she, when she, sometimes she listens to the news with me and, and she sees people talk about, oh, that person's black. So he's not black. What do you mean he's black? See, and then I have to explain to her <laughs> that, well, yeah, he's not, but, you know, the way that the society, you know, you know, she understands a little bit, I think, you know, the way the society sort of defines that person is different than the way the person may want to be defined. See, so, so when we understand that these external causes can affect our sense of reality, you see, then we have to consider that that particular structure or part of society uh, to be uh, 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 something which potentially is a veil hindering us from the reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know. You know. So some would say race is a biological fact. It's just undeniable. Nothing you can get around it. You can get around. And as Muslims, that becomes problematic because if we begin with this idea that, oh, we all come from Adam and Eve, and then we say, well, yes, well, we're different races, right? We're from, we're all one race, but no, no, but we're all multiple races, you see. And that can be problematic, you know, but even if, because even if you read the Quran, some will say, well, the Quran, Allah said he made you into nations and tribes. So there you go. He made you into races. He didn't say he made you into races. He made you into sha'ub wa qaba'in. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. What is actually intended by that, according to the exegetes, the Muslim exegetes? And so, uh, there, there are those amongst anthropologists who say that the human race or species uh, have what they call a uh, monogenetic uh, 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 or a, a, a monogenetic uh, origin, you know, which means that, and this is the view of most anthropologists, uh, that we all originate from a single source, be it first from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then of course from a single, a, a sort of archetype uh, uh, human, human being. Yeah. Now of course Darwinian Anthropology goes a little bit further than that. You know, it talks about an evolutionary process evolving from other types of animals and things like that until eventually we became what we we become. Uh, you know, and I'm not sure if we can really reconcile at least that much about evolution with Islam. But uh, we didn't evolve from apes. Islam doesn't teach us that we evolve evolve from apes. You know, that Allah created Adam alayhi salam. He was a human being, the first human being, and so on. And uh, we became what we are uh, right now. You know, on the other hand, there are those amongst anthropologists who say that, that you know, there's a, we have multiple origins. You know, that not all people come from the same, uh, same uh, uh, mother or father, a mother and father. Uh, and that is a minority view amongst anthropologists historically. But most of them say that we, origin, we originate from a single uh, origin. This hadith, uh, is, uh, in, of course, is written in Arabic. Uh, this is the hadith which... Uh, um, it's a very famous hadith. Uh, it's actually a speech of the Prophet <laughs> uh, which, um, in some versions of the hadith, uh, he has said in it, "La fatli al-Arabi al-Ajmi wa la Ajmi al-Arabi illa bi taqwa." That there is no superiority over, um, no superiority of Arab over non-Arab, nor non-Arab over Arab, except through taqwa, through God consciousness. Now, this is the version of Imam Tirmidhi, actually, and so that particular part of the speech has already been omitted. But, um, but usually when we think of that statement of the Prophet, um, Muslims often believe that that statement was made uh, on the, uh, when? When, was, when did he make that statement? The Fremont Pil Pil Pilgrimage, right? Yeah, that's what Muslims believe. Actually, that's not when he made that statement. You know, the statement actually was made on the day of the conquest of Mecca on the day of the conquest of Mecca. Anybody know why he made this statement? Bilal, what about him? Right. To put it right. Right. That he wanted Bilal to call the Adhan or to call the people to assemble and the Arabs weren't down with that. Okay. That, that's a, a you know, <laughs> a concise way to put it. Um, yeah, but fundamentally that is, that is the cor correct, what it occurred. Now, the Prophet, Islam, he conquered Mecca. Many of the people who had been fighting against him, they had accepted Islam on this day. Uh, and so the, the, the Mufassirin, or the 
among some exegetes, the commentators on the Quran, they mention a story uh, about, or narrations about uh, uh, three men in particular who, are, who had just become Muslim on the day of the conquest. So you can, you can give them a little bit, have a little bit of mercy on them in that regard. And they saw Bilal climbing uh, to the top of the Kaaba. Uh, and one of them said, um, I'm glad my father's not alive to see this. Uh, uh, another one uh, has said, um, you know, if there's any, uh, uh, if, if, if Allah wants to, he'll change this. You know, well, basically, he, he hopes that Allah wants to change this. And then the third one has said, you know, the Muhammad not have anyone other than this black crow to, to call the, to make the summons. Uh, and so word got to the Prophet, والسلام, and then he stood up and gave this speech. He said, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَذْهَبَ عَنْكُمْ عُبِيَةَ جَاهِلِيَةِ وَتَعَظُمَهَا بِأَبَائِهَا That, O oh, uh, people, verily Allah, he has rid you of the vainglory of the pre-Islamic times and your magnification of your fathers. فَالنَّاسُ uh, وَرَجُلَانِ uh, so people are one of two types. Rajulun, barun, taqiyun, karimun ala Allah. The first is a person who is righteous, uh, 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 God conscious, and is valuable to Allah, of great value to Allah. Wa fajirun, shaqiyun, hayyinun ala Allah. And then the other is a wicked person who is wretched and is uh, of no in- insignificance in the sight of Allah. And then he said, "When nasa nasa from Adam, all humanity come from Adam. Wa khalaq Allahu Adam min al turab, and Allah created Adam from dirt. You know. And so, and then in some narrations of the of the speech, and then he says, there's no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab over an Arab, except for uh, for taqwa, except for being for taqwa, right? And then and, uh, and others say that this is actually the occasion when the verse was revealed." When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhun nas inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnaakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna akramakum inda Allahi itqaakum inda Allaha alimun khabir. That, O oh, uh, humanity, O oh, mankind, verily we have created you from a male and female and have made you into uh, shu'uban qaba'il, nations and tribes, li ta'arafu, so that you may acknowledge and know one another. Verily, the most noble of you in the sight of God are those with, who is most, con- most God conscious. And so that verse was revealed uh, in this, uh, this related to this particular event. And so why we begin with the issue of Bilal is not to, uh, again, to take us into discussion of racism because we want to talk about race. But I want to just bring it up because I know that often when somebody says race, they automatically think racism. You know, and, and we also automatically think, when we hear racism, we automatically think black. You know, black or white against black, right? When, when racism actually is something a little bit more than that. And so, so basically, uh, we want to make a distinction between uh, what uh, is meant by race and racism. That when I say race, um, I'm, all, I'm simply just talking about this, the perception and conception uh, that we have of uh, our, uh, be it genetic or phenotypic uh, difference from one another, our ethnic sort of distinctions from one another, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in all people. Uh, and, and then, but when I think of, when I speak of racism, uh, I'm not speaking of uh, one's aesthetic sensibilities, uh, one's aesthetic preferences, like for instance, let's say, uh, uh, white men are head over heels for Indian women, for instance. You know, you know they like uh, you know Chinese or Indian women, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean th- that that doesn't mean that they're self-hating white people, as we would say, because they may not be attracted to their own uh, to women who like themselves. Uh, or the same thing for uh, uh, women attracted to other men who are not of their ethnic background or blacks. So that's that in itself, in terms of like our our taste, the type of cuisine we like the type of clothing we like, the, the colors that sort of we feel accent certain aspects of our, of our, our, our dress and attire. You know, that's one thing. You know, I mean, everyone has a prerogative and you, know, you have your inclination. None of that means that you're a self-hating black person, self-hating white person, or Pakistani. None of, in my opinion, that doesn't mean, that, that means nothing. 
it doesn't mean anything. It, that's not racism if you have a preference for someone who looks different than yourself or in terms of a ma choosing a mate or a certain type of cuisine and things like that. If anything, uh, um, um, you find that statistically that most people actually prefer to marry with, marry, uh, uh, with those who are more akin to them uh, phenotyp phenotypically. Statistics show that. Uh, uh, now, that doesn't mean that people are racist. You know? So if I, for instance, if I don't want to marry a, a non-black person, quote unquote black person, because that's a problematic term in many sense, you know, uh, uh, since uh, uh, that, that doesn't make me uh, uh, a racist. Or if a white person or a person with Irish only wants to marry an Irish person, doesn't make them a racist. You see, not necessarily. Doesn't necessarily make them a racist. It could, yeah, but not necessarily. So we should try not to, that's what we call ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism, you see. And so it's just that, you know, that you find your kind more appealing and more attractive. It could just simply be that the case, and I would argue that that's what it is in most cases. Uh, uh, now with racism, racism, we, when I speak about racism, I'm talking about structural or institutionalized uh, uh, um, uh, policies, laws, right, that, uh, that privilege a certain type of people simply because of the way that they look, right, uh, or a particular caste system they belong to, uh, 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 while uh, it denies privileges to others simply because they don't feel, uh, fit the bill. They don't take on to have the same appearance as those others. That's what I mean when I talk about racism. Personally, when I talk about racism, I mean the instit on its institutional level. You know, so if if Reagan, Ronald Reagan, launches the, dr the, dr the war on drugs, and statistics are telling us that more white people are getting uh, high than black people, and but then all of a sudden, all the efforts of the government are focused in the black neighborhoods, right? To the extent that uh, that more blacks are now being put in prison as opposed to uh, the white people are being put in prison, also using drugs or actually using drugs more than they are. Then that's racism. That's a structural problem. You know, so you go from a prison population of 300,000 to 2 million in, in, in almost 20 years, about 20 years, you see, and most of the people in prison because of some drug-related charge, you know, often because of, uh, because of uh, drug possession, not even sort of selling drugs, but drug possession, like, like marijuana and things like that. And so, uh, uh, and then also, uh, most of those people being indicted or convicted based upon um, um, deals being proposed to them. So people are afraid to admit, they have, they're sort of forced to admit guilt as well in most of these cases. Never proven, in most cases they're not proven, but they're forced to say, listen, if you don't, if you don't accept the deal, then you're gonna, we're going to charge you with this many, we're going to give you this many years, you see. So you have those type of scenarios. That's racism, you see. Now that doesn't mean that we don't try to guide people and condemn those people who are in the, in the neighborhoods are selling drugs and things like that and, and poisoning people. No, but that the greater problem is the system, you see. The greater problem is the system because certain people have been let off and others are being dealt with unjustly. So like the Sharia, anti-Sharia, and all these other things. So, so in the Arabic language, there really is no word for race. Really, there's no word for race in the Arabic language. You know, now, there's a word, unsariya, which is a, what we call a modern standard word, modern standard Arabic. It's not a classical word. You know, unsariya means racism, right? Uh, is a is a is a, a you know is a modern standard word. Uh, but you have, uh, for instance, uh, the closest thing that comes to the the uh, meaning of race is what is called agents. And agents in the Arabic language uh, means genus or species, right? The species of something. Uh, uh, sometimes that means the, of course, the kind or type. Uh, it can mean also gender. It means gender. Yeah. But some scholars use gents as a, to indicate or to uh, identify race or prefer the race. And so you find some of them say, gents al-Arab afdal min gents al-ajam. That the Arab race is more superior than the non-Arab race. You know, that you find these statements among scholars, and Muslim scholars who say this, you know, so they'll use the word jinns. You know, there's another word, a nasab, which usually translates as lineage. And that is more common amongst the, uh, amongst the scholars and Muslim anthropologists. They use lineage, uh, which uh, 
you know, which to me, when I read it, and, and for instance, if I read it in the Khaldun, when he uses lineage, to me, he means race. He means race. This is way, because that's the way he's defining race. Now, in the Quran, the words that are usually translated or understood as race, the words shu'ub and qaba'il, are two different words where the, the exegetes they differ about. Shu'ub is the plural of word shab, which means a people, right? So Allah made you into peoples, wa qaba'il, and tribes, and from qabila. Yeah, and so many of the ulama say that shu'ub is a reference to uh, the divisions of, of the non-Arabs. And the qaba'il are the Arabs. So he made you into non-Arab peoples and he made you into Arab peoples. The qaba'il, you see. And so for this reason, uh, 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 once the scholars started to uh, try to develop a sort of orthodox teaching about uh, superiority or race superiority, uh, and you, actually this does exist that scholars would argue that the Arabs are superior, a superior race to, to non-Arabs. You know, and that's something we can talk about later on. And so, so they, they would say that the position of Ahlul Sunnah is that you have to believe that the Arabs are more superior than other, than other, uh, other races. Uh, uh, and so, those, but those people who objected to this and rejected this understanding, they referred to it as as Shu'ubiyah. The Shu'ubi from Shu'ub. Yeah, like you know, Allah made you into peoples, so the Shu'uviya were termed to be a sort of heretical type of group, the people who don't believe that the Arabs are superior uh, to non-Arabs. So these are discussions that have been had in the past. Uh, and so, so basically, when we uh, start to, to think about in the Islamic context, uh, and actually, and this, this also overlap in the, not the uh, non, non-Muslim tradi- uh, the non-Muslim tradition uh, in, in this regard, that that the that is believed that the race or the entire entire human race was pretty much wiped out during the flood of of Noah alayhi salam. And then after this, uh, after this, uh, uh, the children of Noah were pretty much those who repopulated the planet after the Great Flood. Uh, and this also is alluded to in one surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, after destroying those people, and we made his progeny those who remain. We made his progeny the remainder of them. So, so, so it alludes to this understanding that, that the children of the progeny of Noah were uh, the, uh, uh, those who repopulated the planet. So we find a number of hadith that sort of they, uh, they confirm or they reinforce this understanding. And this is also the same thing in the Christian tradition. We find this as well, many of these uh, reports, uh, even though some can argue that the Muslims perhaps just simply borrowed them from the Christian, these understandings. You know, so there's one report, one hadith that reads that Sam, so the three sons of Noah, Sam, Yafeth, and Ham, right? Uh, so Sam is the father of the Arabs. So the, the Sam, where we get the word Semite, right, from Sam. Right? So it's the Semitic peoples, you know. So the Semitic peoples are from Sam. Uh, Yafeth is the father of the Romans, you know, so basic Europeans generally. And, then, and Ham is the father of the Ethiopians. And the Ethiopians was a general term utilized and applied to black people, you know. So you have these three sort of, uh, three primordial uh, race categories, you know. So uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Arabs and, of course, the, the Romans and Ethiopians. But then the, the next hadith uh, uh, says, Noah, Sam, Ham, and Japheth bore children. Sam bore the Arabs. Sam bore the Arabs, the Persians, and the Romans. So basically the Persian, Arabs, and all of them are attributed to the same origin. And there is goodness in them. Japheth bore Gog and Magog, the Turks, the Slavs, and there is no good in them. <laughs> and Ham bore the Copts, the Berbers, and the Blacks. Uh, and so this uh, hadith is found in the Musnaf of Imam Bazar. So it's a not, a not very popular uh, collection of hadith, but you know, it does exist there. Uh, another narration, to Noah was born Sam, and in his children there was whiteness and brownness. Ham, and in his children there was blackness and a little whiteness, and Yafeth, and in them was pink, pinkness and redness. You know. And so, uh, and then finally, and those, this actually hadith was considered to be fabricated by the scholars. And then finally, uh, and there are a number of hadith I could mention, but I chose these in particular. Imam Ibn Jozi, the humbly scholar of the sixth Islamic century, uh, he reads a hadith, mentions one that says, Ham, Ham bore Kush, Mirash, 
uh, Mu'ag and Bawan. From Bawan came the Slavs, the Nubians, the Ethiopians, the Indians, and the Sindh. You know. So you find actually Indians and the Sindh, Sindh you know, that they actually fall within, along with the blacks and so on, you know, according to that particular hadith. You know, so you have these three primordial races of three primordial colors. You know, it's the black, white, and red. So this is a very uh, original sort of, uh, a sort of historical sort of um, a per a, a perception of race. Um, and uh, um, as, so th that's with regard to race being a, a reference to uh, being a sort of a biological fact in the, the eyes of certain people. That it sort of comes down to that. Even though there are many, so I'm giving you sort of a, brevi in a very abbreviated version of this. You know, this, this actually can be like a, a, a whole like one or two, two semester class, if not even longer than that. You know, but I'm giving you a very, very condensed and abbreviated version of all of this. You know, but, but for those who argue that race is a social contract, uh, they, they say that, for instance, if one, one author, one scholar, uh, Matthew Fry Jacobson, who has a book called Whiteness of a Different Color. And in this book, what he basically argues is that, that uh, white people in America, there's a hierarchy even in whiteness, you see. And not all white people, who are people we consider to be white people, they were were white, always white, you see. You know, that something happened in the laws that changed in the 20th century in particular that made people who, who traditionally had not been considered to be white, white. You know, so the Jews, the, the Italians, the Irish, uh, uh, people like that, uh, they were not considered to be white. You know. And so when we read, for instance, uh, we the people of the United States, you know, or every man is created equal, that those statements uh, basically are biased towards the Anglo-Saxon, you know. So we the people mean the Anglo-Saxon. You know, the all men are created equal. Literally men mean not women. Men, you know, but definitely Anglo-Saxon, right? So everybody else is polluted in some way, you know, but eventually things occurred in the country that uh, accommodated uh, these other peoples who we consider to be white today. So uh, Matthew Fry Jacobs in his book, uh, he mentions that race is not just a conception, Right? And there's also a perception. And what it means by that is that, uh, that we begin with these, um, these ideas that sometimes they may originate with ourselves or we're given to us uh, from, from, from without. And then the perception of the truthfulness or the reality of those definitions and constructs make us even to reinforce these ideas. So for instance, I remember some years ago, uh, uh, Tiger Woods had sort of denied his blackness, right? And a lot of black people were up in arms about this. Like, oh, what you, you know, oh, he's a self-hating Negro and so on. Uh, when, when, I, when I saw this, I personally, I felt like, well, you know, everybody has the right to define themselves. Uh, you know. But because of black people's sense of, you know, of, of solidarity, I guess you would say, with people who they considered to be of their same color, uh, they felt that this was what we call sort of Uncle Tomism, right? You know, that he was sort of denying uh, uh, his blackness and trying to, you know, people we find out they have Indian blood in them because they like, I got some Indian blood in me, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm not really black, you know. I said, right, exactly, right. <laughs> right, I'm Cherokee, you know. So, <laughs> so, so that, that needs to be understood that, that, uh, um, that our perception of, 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 black uh, uh, or natural blackness or this idea that we are all sort of genetically all this, well, we're all genetically the same, but we're all sort of one single people, you know, against this majority and majority white people, right? That we have to understand that was a construction, that we were defined by the actual people that we feel often to be in opposition to, you know, and so we perpetuated uh, uh, the, those understanding. Uh, another, another scholar, uh, Audrey Smedley, uh, had this to say about the word race. It said that, um, said that uh, or she said, it was intri intricately linked with certain presuppositions of thought held by European co uh, colonists from the 16th to the 18th century. During that period, the word was transformed in the English language from a mere classificatory, classificatory term of biophysical variation into a folk idea. This idea expressed certain attitudes toward human differences as well as prejudgments about the nature and social value of these differences. 
So even the word race itself has undergone, undergone a, an evolution. And so this is show you, give you a sort of glimpse at this. If we start in uh, 1758, uh, a, 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 an anthropologist by the name of uh, Carolus Linnaeus, or we just call it sometimes Carl Linnaeus, he wrote his book, uh, Systema Natru Naturae. Uh, and in this book, he tried to classify the, the, what we call the human races. See? And so basically, uh, he sort of nailed it down to four. So they had four types of people on the planet. You know, so one being, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, based first and foremost, is that people, uh, in terms of their behavior, I will come to the, the divisions of the people in a second, but, but people's behavior are determined by a balance of what we call the four humors, these four fluids in the body. This was a pseudoscience or a scientific understanding. So the, the balance between blood, phlegm, uh, what we call choleric, with a yellow bile, and melancholy, a black bile in the body. So depending on how much uh, uh, of, of an imbalance you have in one or more of these things would determine what type of character or personality your moods may be. So for instance, uh, uh, they have terms like sanguine, if you're a sanguine person, you're a cheerful person, you know, a phlegmatic, you're sluggish, uh, choleric, you're sort of prone to anger. Uh, and melancholic, that you're sort of a sad type of person, you see, based upon these humors. You know, but then uh, when we look at this four part type division of the human races, and so he said the black, the white, the red, and the yellow, that, or we even saw the American, Euro the uh, European, the Asian, and African. These were four basic categories. So when he goes to try to describe these people in terms of uh, their, uh, their humor, the humors, the color, the human posture and behavior patterns, he says of the American, and the American he means by the, like the Native Americans, the Indians, right? The Aboriginal peoples. You know, so for them, they're, okay, their color, they're red, they're choleric. And choleric means what? Who remembers? You know, choleric means prone to anger, right? right? And they're upright in terms of their posture, very upright posture, you know. Uh, and then he also said of them that they are ruled by habits. You know, ruled by habit. I'll come back to that in a second to show you the significance of it. Of the European, he says, they're white, sanguine. Sanguine means what? Happy. Very happy, cheerful people, right? And they're muscular, right? And they're ruled by custom. Now, what's the difference between, between these two? I mean, of course, I mean, when you look at, you know, I'm choleric or I'm sanguine, you know. <clears throat> I get angry, you know, I'm sanguine. You know, and so, so, so naturally, uh, even though it's not as, as overt in terms of this sort of racist inclination that's involved, so basically say his own people, of course, it's better, it sounds better to say, you know, somebody's a happy person than to say that they're an angry person, you know, and then also it's better to say you're muscular as opposed to you're sluggish, you see? Uh, you know, the muscular, yes, we're muscular people, but then to say that you're ruled by habits, as opposed to custom. So custom is, there's something involved with custom. Custom is like, okay, well, you actually, this is something you thought it out. You're actually using your brain. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, well, this developed these customs and everything to help other people. Well, habit is like, uh, well, you know, I got addicted to something. I can't help myself, right? You know, so, so, to, to the, so the Americans are, are ruled by habit. Either the the Amer Amer Amerindians are ruled by habit, and then you have the Europeans ruled by custom. You know, the, for the Asians, they are pale yellow, melancholy, Right, what's melancholy? Sad, Sad right? Yeah. Stiff, stiff people, you know. They're ruled by belief, you know. You know so kind of like, you know, you know, legends, fairy tales, folklore, you know. It's, you know, it's not custom, you know. Custom is, you know, ruled by custom. Use your brain, your, your intellect, you know. You will believe, oh, it's just this tales of the ancients, right? Uh, and then when it comes to the Africans, they're black, phlegmatic. Phlegmatic is what? Huh? Lit? Oh. <laughs> That's what we're waiting for. Lazy, right? Right, exactly. Lazy. Uh, so relaxed, he says. Relaxed. <laughs> and, they're, and they're ruled by caprice. So you're not even ruled by habit. They're ruled by caprice. You know, because animals are ruled by caprice, right? Aren't they? You know, I'm hungry. There's a, you know, I'm a lion. Uh, you know, there's a deer. Ah! You know, uh, my desires, right, rule me. I rule by my desires. I mean, and these are people who are like being read and 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 consulted uh, and, cons and consulted by 
uh, uh, you know, um, dignitaries, right? These weren't just some normal people, guy just, guy just writing a book, you know, this is some obscure book. These were normative teachings. Uh, now, a, a man who came after him, uh, Johann Friedrich, Friedrich Blumenbach, uh, wrote in 19, 1795 another book, actually, where he did, he just simply added another category. Instead of saying four and then five, so he added the melee, the brown people, to, to the category of race. And, so, and so, so basically, what I want to do at this point is to show you in terms of like the theory of, of racial construction. And again, we can't go through all of this, but remember there's a colonial period. In the colonial period, at one point, the Spanish, they were the, those who were in, in, in power. They were the, those who were in charge. And so one particular example I want to show you about how those people, when they came, for instance, into Mexico, and the type of racial classifications they developed. And I'm only going to show you about four of these, these types of racial classifications, but there are about 16 or 19 classifications of people, uh, of races of people that they, that they developed uh, uh, under, the, under the Spanish. Uh, so for instance, there's one called, we call it mestiza, mestizaje uh, people. And so the mestiza are like when you have a Spanish father and then a Native American mother. Uh, so Spanish father, Native American mother, so you see the child there, the baby, you know, sort of uh, gives you an idea of what would come out as. Uh, the second is what we call castizo or castiza for the female, is when the Spanish father is a Spanish father and a mestiza mother, right? So his mestiza, right? Mestiza is a result of a Spanish father, Native American mother, right? Right, right, exactly. And then castizo, castiza, Spanish father, mestiza mother. Then you have another uh, degree, Española or the Espomolo, uh, where you have the Spanish mother and Castiza father. So you look at the child, you see. Then the fourth, the Cholo or the Chola, Mestizo father and Native American mother. And that's what you would get. So you have, and so this is only four of them, but they are like, it continues, it goes on and on and on. And so you have a construction of race. And um, in, the, in North America, for instance, we have in Virginia, uh, in 1662 in Virginia, um, uh, there were laws passed in Virginia that pretty much uh, uh, made uh, every baby child born to a woman who was black, an African descent, to be a slave automatically through birth, matrilineally. Um, in 1663, in Maryland, another law was a passed in Maryland. Actually, it pretty much made all people black who were considered to be slaves. Even if they're already free, <laughs> this law was passed. They passed a law and said everybody who's black, you know, is automatically uh, a slave. You know, and, and then 1681, that was returned to its original uh, rule of following the matrilineal pattern, basically that if a black woman gives birth to a child, then that child is automatically a slave through birth, you know. Um, and so we f see some of those, those problems there. Uh, in 1924, again, Virginia, being that it was the first uh, English colony, you know, all of these things are sort of happening in Virginia and then, and the, you know, and then you know, Maryland, areas like that. Uh, in 1924 is where we get the uh, Racial Integrity Act. The Racial Integrity Act is what we call the, the, uh, the act which pretty much passed the law of the one drop rule, as you would say, right? The one drop rule, you know, so you have one drop of black African blood, then you're black. Right? Even if you look white, you know, if you discover that you have some degree of African blood in you, then you're considered to be white. And we see that this sort of worked its way up, all the way up into the 20th century, you see. Um, and if you get a chance, you know, go online, look at the Racial Integrity Act, because I don't want to keep everybody too long. Uh, so I'm trying to go through this, uh, try to get to uh, the, the main issue, of course, uh, in regards to the Islamic tradition. But during the 1920s to the 1960s is really the period when sort of whiteness became sort of consolidated. You know? So those people who generally were not considered to be white prior to that time were now automatically, they were considered to be white. And then uh, we know that the, the, uh, the act itself, the Racial Integrity Act was abolished eventually. Uh, you know, then of course, 1965, the immigration, New Immigration Act allowed immigration from many different parts of the world, generally were not allowed from. <coughs> and, um, so Matthew Fry Jacobson says that the period from the 1920s to the 1960s saw a dramatic decline in the perceived differences among these white others. Immigration restriction along with internal black migrations 
altered the nation's racial alchemy and, with, and redrew the dominant racial co configuration along the strict binary line of white and black, creating Caucasians where before had been so many Celts, Hebrews, Teutons, Mediterraneans, and Slavs. Right. So all of those divisions existed prior to them, and all of a sudden there's a consolidation that occurs in uh, America. And so, so you can see how people are being constructed. You know? So you are, a con conception of race is created, and then you start to perceive it as the truth, as a reality. Yeah. And you can say the same thing for the Arabs. When we think of Arabness, I mean, what does an Arab look like? Right? Or what is an Arab supposed to look like? Uh, there are many Muslims, you know, from Afghanistan and Pakistan and even Africa, where they'll say, well, no, we're, we're descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And often people will laugh. You're a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. You're African. Yeah. Or you're from Afghanistan. You can't possibly be descendant from the Prophet Muhammad. You know, or you're from you know, somewhere else, other place, you know, Indonesia. How can you possibly be a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad? You're not an Arab. He was an Arab. And the, the, what an Arab is, you know, is, is, is not clearly defined. Because if we just simply reflect upon the origin of the Arabs, that the origin of the Arabs of, are two, are believed to be two different uh, uh, strains, the two different original strains of Arabs. Well, put it like this, of the, those who came about prior to the, uh, 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 the marriage of Ismail into Banu Jurham, they were what, those, those who were called the bygone Arabs, right? These the original Arabs who had pretty much wandered around and the people of, La, uh, people of Tumud and Ad and you know, as mentioned in the Quran, you know, and generally they, they're believed to have sort of died off, you know, but then these other Arabs appear, you know, these Arabs who origin, originate from Yemen, uh, and so they uh, generally um, um, are considered to be the sins of, of a man known as Qahtan, Qahtan. When Hajar alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam come into uh, Mecca and the the, the desolate area of Mecca, um, eventually one of the tribes from, from, from Yemen, Banu Jurham, make their way to there and they meet them and they ask for them to, could they stay there with them? And they did. And eventually Ismail, as he grew older, he married into the tribe. And so, of course, children were born and then these people will become to be recognized as themselves as, as Arabs as well. But Ismail himself... You know, his mother was Hajar, and Hajar was from where? From Egypt, right? She was a Coptic, according to strongest views, she was a Coptic, a dark, one very dark woman amongst the Coptics. And Ibrahim, you know, he wasn't an Arab as well. He wasn't also an Arab, you know. And so Ismail is the son of those two people. And so he marries a woman from, from Yemen, another dark people. Uh, and, and then the Arabs, you know, spread out from there. See, so these two strains, the Adnani and the Qahtani, Arabs, are, are born. So see, right from the very beginning, there's no such thing as a pure Arab. You see? So basically, uh, we, what you come to understand from this is that uh, to become an Arab was not very difficult. Simply as a matter of like, you can intermarry, you become an Arab, or your, your children are born, uh, uh, or their first language becomes Arabic, and all of a sudden, uh, they become Arabs through that. <clears throat> oh, did I miss something? Right, so, so Ibn Khaldun, this is what actually he says about the issue of Arabs. You know, he says, uh, we have already stated in the previous section that the nomadic peoples are those who embrace the natural mode of subsistence, of farming and tending to livestock. As for those whose mode of subsistence is agriculture and tending to livestock, sed sed sedentariness is more fitting than trans transiency. As for those whose mode of subsistence is connected with camels, they are most transient and venture furthest into the uninhabited wastelands, and these are the Arabs. Now, of course, I admitted a lot of things, but sort of want to give you the crux of what he was saying. So basically here, he's not, when he talks about an Arab, he doesn't say anything about a certain color, certain lineage they come from. He's actually talking about something they did, right? As a people, you know, they, they, they tended to camels. and So this is how he's describing the Arabs, from the very very start of it. And, and we find the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, 
تعلموا من أنسابكم ما تصلون به أرحمكم. You know, learn about your lineages enough to maintain the ties of kinship. Uh, and there's another statement that sort of counteracts this, uh, which is not a statement of the Prophet ﷺ, but just a saying that people had that النصبوا إلم لا ينفع وجهارة لا تضر. That that lineage is a knowledge, or say race is a knowledge uh, that yields no benefit. Uh, and an ignorance of which causes no harm. Now, Ibn Khaldun, he, he, he basically said both statements are true. But it's just that when we think of the first, the Prophet is actually encouraging us to gain knowledge of our lineages, gain knowledge of where we come from, for what purpose? The purpose of maintaining ties of kinship to people. You know, and, and through maintaining ties of kinship, we, we pass on, on wealth. We also come to the defense of others. You know, we have a sense of solidarity, sense of cohesion, uh, a sense of, of patronage as well, uh, that those are desirable things. Like Ibn Khaldun even talked about, they're desirable things. You know, so, so, so we can have that in our lives. But when those things don't result and don't exist, then they're, they're really uh, pointless you know, for us to sort of pride ourselves in who we are and where we come from. And that's why he find, you find him saying as well uh, on, on other pages, for instance, in the first quote, he says that the only benefit of lineage is this cohesion that leads to maintaining bonds of kinship until patronage and chauvinism result. Anything beyond that is dispensable, since lineage is an illusory matter. Yeah, that lineage is an illusory, is illusory matter. Race is an illusory matter. It's imaginary. It's not even real. He said, It has, it has no reality. Because he argues, he goes in his show in this book how People become members of the tribe just simply by, okay, well, I'm fleeing and, uh, from someone trying to kill me. I come to, your, to your, 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 your village, you take me in, and you accept me as one of your own, and then all of a sudden I become associated with that particular people, you see. And this happened quite, quite often. And so the Arabs themselves were very diverse people of many different types of multicolored people. Yeah. They were generally a, what we call a black people. It's like in America, a black people. There are many different shades of them. Most of them were brown and, and dark, and dark black. So... Uh, uh, so, but this is, and then there were, there were very, some of them who were very white colored, light colored as well, because they were all submerged or accepted into Arabness simply through acculturation and through the acceptance of language. That language is what made them Arabs. And then in another quote, he said, There is not a single member of the human race who possesses an uninterrupted honor among his fathers from Adam to himself except for that which exists for the Prophet Sallallahu as a mark of, honor, mark of honor for him and a protection uh, of the secret in him. So basically, he's to say that, you know, there's really, a, if anybody wants to make a brag about lineage and have a pure lineage, the only person we know who actually does have one is the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, who is well established that, you know, that his lineage can be traced back, you know, but even still, of course, they're all mixed people, you know, even, even, even in that regard. So, um, so basically, that's the end of my, my presentation uh, uh, about this particular topic. I know it's been a little bit long. Uh, so I mean, if there are any comments, any questions, we can, like I said, this is the conversation that we could probably go all night with, you know, but of course, we want everybody to get an opportunity to go back home. And uh, inshallah, perhaps in the future, we have some follow-up uh, with regard to uh, this or, or similar topic, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Uh-huh.